Touring with a gospel artist can be the worst mistake of your life because some of the things that you see and experience on the road with many of these gospel artists, you can never come back from. In this video, I'm gonna share with you some shocking details of being on tour with the gospel artist you know. So being on tour with a gospel artist can be something that's cool, but it's also something that can really change your perspective for the worse once you learn what happens behind the scenes on a lot of these tours and with a lot of these artists. So I'm going to share with you some really gritty details of a tour that I had with a gospel artist. So you will see what I mean. So buckle up. And I won't say this artist's name just for integrity purposes, but I think you'll probably be able to figure out from the details I share. So this gospel artist released one of the biggest gospel songs of all time in the late 90s. And when I say big, I'm not kidding. Like every church was singing this song. And when praise dancing was the thing, every praise dance team praise danced to the song. And the song is still really popular to this day. So I was really excited when I got the call to go on tour with this artist. So how it came about was there was a benefit concert going on in my city at the time for I believe this young lady that had a terminal illness. There were multiple church choirs and such from around the city that was going to perform at this concert. And this gospel artist was like the special guest. He was the headliner. So I, along with some other musicians, were playing for this particular church choir. And we were like just slamming hard. Like it was one of those times where everything was just going right and we was killing it. So as it turns out, this gospel artist heard us playing and he liked what he heard so much that he came out of his green room to hear us playing. So after the concert, all of the people were standing around trying to, you know, meet him and get his autograph and all of that, along with us musicians. And when we got up to him, he immediately recognized that we were the musicians he liked and he pulled us aside. He told us that he really liked what he heard and that he was looking for some musicians to go on a tour with him that he was about to do. So of course, we're like all excited, right? Because that's like the ultimate compliment. That's what every musician wants to do. We want to go out on tour, right? So a couple of weeks later, he called us and offered us the job and we took it. And the next four months is really something that changed everything for me. Now, the rest of this story is about to get a little gritty and I'm going to get right to it. But right now, make sure you like this video and make sure you subscribe to the channel. I'd really appreciate that. So if I remember correctly, we only had about one or two rehearsals before the tour started. And honestly, that was all we needed because when we got the call from this guy, we immediately start going through all of his music and learning it meticulously. So when we got to rehearsal, we was good. But when we got to that first rehearsal, I noticed something that seemed really strange to me at the time. And that is out of all of his group of singers, he had about 12 to 15 singers all of them were women. And what was strange about that to me is that if you know gospel music of that time, you know that it was written in such a way that you needed at least a few males to hold down those tenor parts. Now, mind you, I'm in my early 20s at the time and I'm in college. And part of my excitement about going to college was to get girls. You know, that's just kind of what we thought about back then. So when I got this call for this tour, I was really kind of nervous and scared because I'm like, I'm about to go on tour with all of these holy people that are serious about religion and all of that. And I got to get my stuff together. I got to get my life together. Stop chasing girls and all of that. Right now, keep that part of the story in mind for what I'm about to tell you. So our first tour date was in Washington, D.C. And I remember because it was really cold there. It was in the middle of winter and it was my first time in D.C. But when we would travel to a city to perform there, they would have a bus or a van there for us that we would travel back and forth to the hotel and to the venue on and all of that. Right. So on the bus ride of this first tour date, I sat next to the girl that sang the lead on this very popular gospel song that I mentioned earlier. And she seemed really cool. Like we got to talking. I was asking her questions about how the group got started, who was related to who and all of that. Right. And at some point during that conversation, it got a little confidential. She started telling me everything who was married, who was divorced, who was sleeping with who, who was sleeping with the gospel artist, the big name gospel artist. And she was literally sharing so much stuff with me that my head was like exploding inside. But, you know, I was keeping it cool as I could. And I remember asking her one question that is like the epitome of this entire story. So 
me being confused and new to all of this and just experiencing it for the first time, I asked her this question. I said, how is it possible that all of these people are doing this kind of stuff and getting away with it. Because remember, I'm thinking like, I gotta get myself together because you know, in some way doing that kind of stuff, you'd be punished for. And she looked at me and calmly answered with one word. She said, discretion. Now remember this word because it's about to come into play in a big way. So we go on to do that performance in DC and it was great, it's probably what you'd expect from you know, performing a really popular gospel song at the time, and that was cool. But it's what happens later that night that gets like really wild. And this is where the story gets a little more graphic, so you've been warned. So we get back to our hotel room that night, and it's late, it's around nine or 10 o'clock, and I was rooming with one of the other musicians, and when we got to the room, he immediately crashed. He was like, you know, burnt out with jet lag and all of that, so he was crashed. So after about 15 or 20 minutes or so of being in the room, I hear this knock on the door, and I'm up, so I get up to answer the door, and guess who it is? It's this same girl. It's the girl who sang the lead on this really popular gospel song who I was sitting next to on the bus. So I opened the door and she was just like, hey, I'm just coming to check on y'all, make sure everything is okay, make sure your room is good and all of that. And I'm like, oh, that's so nice of you. Like, yeah, our room is great. We got all of these amenities and stuff because we were in a really fancy hotel. So we got all of this stuff in here, so we cool. So she was like, oh, let me come see. So she ended up staying in the room and stuff for a while and we got to talking again and she started telling me more confidential stuff and all of that. And it was a double room, like there were two beds in there and the other musician was in the other bed, like crashed out, knocked out sleep. And she and I were sitting on my bed. And at some point during that conversation, I just kind of lay back on my bed, you know, where the pillows are, like with my back up a little bit and my feet still out, but I put my feet under the covers and she was sitting on the end of the bed. So. I was in the middle of a sentence saying something to her and I suddenly felt something on my leg and it was just sitting there on my leg. So I just thought maybe I had shifted some kind of way and the blanket had done something weird and just kind of sat on top of my lower leg, right? But then whatever it was on my leg started moving and started sort of rubbing and stroking my leg. And at this point, my mind was like in total shock, right? because I was trying to come to grips with what was actually going on here. Because remember, as I said, there was a big part of me that was like, oh my God, I gotta get myself together. I gotta be holy and all of that kind of stuff. But the other part of my mind was like, well, I know what this is and I know what's happening here and this don't seem holy to me. So as my mind is coming to grips with what is going on here, what I soon discovered was that hand on my leg starts slowly but surely moving up my leg. And the crazy funniest part about this is that she was still having a conversation with me, talking to me as if this wasn't even happening. Now you recall that word I told you to remember earlier? Well, after I came to grips with what was actually going on here, I asked her the question. I said, how is it that what's happening here, like you plan to get away with that? And she answered with the most confident, calm voice that I had ever heard. And she said the word again, discretion. And when she said that word, it must have been like a cold word to open the floodgates and go full steam because from that moment, she stuck her head under the blanket, came up my legs and persisted to do what I can only describe as Cirque du Soleil circus tricks with her mouth. And still to this day, I think back on that moment like, and it gets even more weird because after it was finished, she got up, cleaned up a bit, walked to the door, said, okay, I'll see you in the morning. Like nothing had just happened. And the rest of this tour was so unbelievably weird to me because this girl was an amazing singer. I'm telling you, when we would sing that particular song that I was telling you about, the really popular song, the moment she opened her mouth to sing it, people would be falling out and shouting and all of that. But what was weird to me was that I could never see her mouth the same. Now, added to all of that craziness, the reason that me, along with some of the other musicians, stopped touring with this group and this dude was because he wrote us a hot check 
for a payment that he owed us. He gave us a check, which I still have to this day, by the way, for a bank that had gone out of business two years prior to then. And it made my bank account at the time overdraft. So I had to pay like all of these overdraft fees and I had to cover the cost of that check. And despite calling this dude, his office, his secretary, multiple times a week, multiple times a day for like three months straight, we could never get a hold of him. His secretary would always be like, well, he's not in, he's out. And that was the last we ever heard of this dude. And I'm really tempted to say his name right now so you can know what kind of crook he is because it really pisses me off every time I think about it, but I'm not gonna do it. And needless to say, this entire situation really changed my perspective on what these so-called gospel artists are about. And I have some stories about some other gospel artists that is just as crazy that I could share with you as well. But you see how touring with some of these gospel artists can really mess you up? And honestly, I feel lucky because I know of some stories where some of these male gospel artists do stuff on these tours like that to little boys. And that's just despicable. It's like a lot of them have this air about them where they get to this stage where they think they're so powerful that they can do this stuff and they can just get away with it. Which reminds me of a lot of these pastors and such that have that sort of same air about them. And you should go check out this video right now where I expose what some of these pastors are doing to church musicians.